the look of pain, the look of hope, the look of contentment, the look of wonder. Every face tells a tale, and all the tales together make up the story of the Lowell Humane Society. That the Humane Society exists at all forces us to acknowledge the darker side of human nature. That it has stood for 140 years reminds us there is also goodness, and assures us that whenever there is a call for help, someone will always be willing to answer it. 140 years ago, the first call for help is heard. It comes from the city's horses. In 1873, Lowell is a city in constant motion. It has 52 mills and 45,000 people. Horses are the engines that keep everything moving. They haul freight, deliver goods, provide public services, and transport people. Even the trolley cars are pulled by horses. But for all they do, the horses are taken for granted. They are overworked and suffer neglect and abuse. They overheat from exertion and lack of water in the summer, and freeze when they are left without blankets between rounds in the winter. Prompted by their concern for the horses' welfare, a group of citizens creates a charter and elects a board of directors. On May 8th, the newspapers announce the formation of the Lowell Humane Society and list its objectives. The prevention of cruelty to animals by all proper means and the prevention of all cruelty through humane education. The Humane Society sets up an office in the Boston and Maine Railroad Depot. Unlike other welfare societies which can provide help only when someone is brought to them, the Humane Society has agents with the power to investigate cruelty and prosecute those responsible for it. Under the leadership of Charles F. Richardson, the agents monitor the trolley cars and dray teams. Owners are ordered to remove lame horses from service. Overheated horses are given relief. The agents also inspect the weekly animal auctions to prevent the sale of sick or unfit animals. Not taken seriously at first, their legal authority soon earns the agents the respect of the local businessmen. Cases of neglect go down dramatically. For horses. For children, the story is different. A new call for help is heard. Their credibility firmly established, the agents receive requests from citizens and local police to investigate stories of abandoned, neglected, and abused children. Life for mill workers is hard. The days are long, and the work does not pay well. Many immigrants coming to Lowell from warmer climates have no knowledge of the harsh New England winters. Exhausted, demoralized, and without enough money to feed their families, let alone provide heat for them, many parents suffer depression. They turn to alcohol for relief. At best, children are left to fend for themselves. At worst, they become targets of their parents' frustration. The agents prefer to work with parents when they can, warning them of the consequences of not taking care of their children but they often have no choice but to remove the children from their homes and place them in the care of other agencies, such as the Lowell Day Nursery. The agents work closely with representatives from the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children and will continue to do so until 1930, when the MSPCC takes over all cases of child abuse in Lowell. By the 1930s, things are changing. The mills are closing or moving away. There are no more animal auctions. The trolley cars run on electricity. Like everyone else, the horses are losing their jobs. As the horses' needs abate, another call for help is heard. Under the leadership of President William Potter, the Humane Society turns its attention to pets. In the economic downturn, the number of strays is rising. Mr. Potter writes weekly newspaper columns regarding the care of dogs, cats, and rabbits. Other columns warn that the Humane Society will prosecute any driver in a hit-and-run accident involving an animal. He uses the annual celebration of Be Kind to Animals Week to further the Society's work in humane education. In 1931, the Humane Society opens its first shelter in the Hamilton Mill Building. 
It can house up to 25 animals. In the first week, Beauty, a young mother-to-be, moves in. And soon, the Humane Society's first litter of puppies is born. The newspapers have a field day. Beauty puts a new face on the Humane Society. It has become a place that provides care to animals. The shelter at the Hamilton Mill building is destroyed in the flood of 1936, and William Potter passes away. However, his legacy lives on in the permanent shelter that his sisters have built in his memory in 1939. Today, that shelter still stands at 951 Broadway Street. To be sure, today's shelter looks different. In 1979, it gets a new addition. Urban Renewal benefits the shelter, providing some of the funds needed to expand the building. The Humane Society asks the community for help providing the rest. Put a little money in the kitty signs become a familiar sight. The community responds, and a group of children make the first private donation to the new facility. Humane education takes on a greater role. Staff members visit local schools and give tours of the shelter. Within the shelter itself, the role of agent is slowly transitioning to animal caregiver. But before the agents ride off into the sunset, they will have one last blaze of glory. A call for help is about to go up that will be heard around the world. On November 28, 1989, a dog named Champ is chained to a post and his owner kicks him and hits him with a two-by-four. He is not the first dog ever to be beaten. This isn't even the first time he himself has been beaten. But this time, Champ's neighbor takes pictures and gives them to the Humane Society. Alan Davidson, the Society's director, takes custody of Champ and files animal cruelty charges against his owner. The pictures hit the papers. To use today's terminology, Champ's story goes viral. He appears in newspaper articles across the country and as far away as Germany. People magazine features him in two of their issues. When Champ's family threatens to try to regain custody, the shelter is flooded with over 4,000 letters, all demanding that Champ not be given back to his family. In the end, Champ's family drops the custody battle. His owner is convicted of animal cruelty and serves six months in jail. Champ finds a loving home with 18 acres of land where he can run and play to his heart's content. Why Champ was so special cannot be easily answered, but his story is a powerful example of what can happen when a group of people cares enough to take action. And it is a reminder that all great events start with something small. One person sent up a call for help, and an entire community responded. The next call for help would come from the Humane Society itself. The 21st century opens on a period of turmoil within the society. Financially, it is not doing well. Neither is it keeping pace with advances being made in the greater animal welfare community. Public interest is waning. After 40 years of service, the executive director retires, as does the Humane Society's last agent. It is the end of an era. When the national economy starts sliding downhill in 2007, the already beleaguered Humane Society is pushed to the brink. Donations aren't coming in, animals are surrendered in record numbers, and the shelter is showing its age. Newly elected board president Grace Jeans presents the board with a hard decision. Do they cease operations and liquidate assets, or undertake the Herculean task of revitalizing the 134-year-old society? Through the newspapers, the board makes a direct plea to the community. Without help, the Humane Society will be forced to close its doors. The response is swift and positive. Among the first to come forward are two girls who celebrate their 10th birthdays by asking their friends to make donations to the shelter. Besides donations, people provided needed supplies, blankets, food, and cat litter. The animal welfare community also pitches in. New relationships are forged with rescue groups and other humane societies who willingly share their expertise. The board appoints Liz Shaw as interim director. 
She generously works for eight months without pay, updating the shelter's processes. Together, she and Jeans shape the vision for the shelter's future. The overwhelming support gives new heart to the staff and board of directors. It was like a snowball rolling downhill, Jean said. One person stepped forward, and then another, and it just kept growing. The board hires a permanent director, Jill O'Connell. Under her leadership, the Humane Society creates volunteer and foster care programs and forms stronger relationships with area veterinarians. Whereas in the past only the young, strong, and healthy animals were put up for adoption, now every animal coming into the shelter is evaluated impartially and given a fair chance to find a loving home. It has been a long road, but thanks to the kindness and hard work of many people, the future is filled with a sense of financial stability and exciting new possibilities. As its 140th year of service to the greater Merrimack Valley draws to a close, the Lowell Humane Society stands stronger than ever before, assuring us that whenever there is a call for help, they will be there to answer it.